。止まっちゃった。大丈夫か。Okay, to start? Just a moment. I, I, 僕が最初話をしますあ。はいはい、お願いします。なんか僕のビデオこ動かない。So, let's start. Welcome to this evening lecture organized by Meiji University IOD. My name is Kozo Kadowaki. Some of you may, some of you may have never seen me before. I am an associate professor in the Department of Architecture at the ICTA campus.、Uh, anyway, this lecture was planned as a special program for IOD's new students. But of course, all people are welcome. So let's begin with a greeting from Professor Masami Kobayashi, the course director of IOD. Masami sensei, please. Hello,、um, everyone. Um, sorry, uh, my uh, computer is not <laughs> working well. So you can see my photo here.、Um, <clears throat> today,、uh, we are welcoming the Alexander Erickson Ferris and Suda Kaduka san <laughs> to give us a very kind, kind lecture in English. And、uh, we are very much expecting about the、um, pedagogic. Educational and also professional,、uh, the, their works. So,、um, maybe many of the freshmen of、uh, IOD students are joining, and some are from、uh, other countries. So, um, uh, let's, let's enjoy the special lecture today, tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Masami Sensei. So, I'd like to introduce today's guest again. The first one is an architect, Sudarshan V. Kadoka Jr. Suda, would you give us a short greeting? Yes, hello.、Uh, good evening.、Uh, thank you for inviting us to share with you the things that we've been doing for the past eight years. And it's really an honor to be here to share all of this with you. And、uh, we're excited to, to be part of this、um, lecture series. Thank you, Suda. And the second person is architect Alexander Erickson Furness. Alex, can you say something? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us.、Uh, we appreciate、uh, being here. Thanks, Alex. And Sudar and Alex have been working on community engagement projects based on workshops around the world. And they are the curators of the Philippine Pavilion. At the current Venice Architecture Biennale. And their work is on display、uh, there as well, which is getting a lot of attention. Tonight, we, tonight will be a good opportunity to, to learn more about their attempts. And after the lecture, we will take questions for Sudan and Alex, where you can post your questions to the link I will provide soon. So, Sida and Alex, let's get started. All right, again, once again, thank you, Koza, for the introduction. I mean, we're happy to really、um, get into the details of how we are, have structured our practice and how we've been working together for the past few years. Thank you. So, what we thought we'd do today is to share with you some ideas of how we understand and practice architecture. But to do that, we also need to talk about society. Or the way that we understand the situation that we find ourselves in and how we choose to question it. We believe our built environment is a direct result of the values and understandings that shape our society. So, if you are to question the way that we build, we also need to question the way that we live. On a global scale, the way we live together now has proven unsustainable, both socially and environmentally. As a paradigm of economic growth spread across the globe, Productivity and efficiency of the market became prioritized over other social and environmental values. Within this paradigm, collective and individual values are understood separately. Competition instead of co survival leads to progress, and civilization equals departure from nature. Something is wrong with the way that we live together when people feel distanced from their own surroundings, when construction is primarily for speculation and profit making. 
when buildings are mere products to be bought and sold, when resources are scarce due to overextraction, and when laborers are exploited. So today's environmental and social challenges need to be addressed as interconnected problems. And in our practice, we explore how traditions of mutual support could offer an alternative understanding of how we have lived together. So most cultures around the world have forms of mutual support, whether it's called bayanihan or dugnat, doikong, mutiao, or even shogo fujo, or how to say it in, in Japanese. So that these traditions are not defined by any specific task, organization, or purpose. Instead, it provides a way of organizing and working together to fulfill a purpose collectively defined by those that practice it. In the absence of government support, for example, it functions as a form of community welfare. And during calamities, it provides safety nets as a means for recovery. In agriculture, it enables farmers to secure needed labor for harvesting. It has enabled communities to build with the materials available and allow the members of the community to help with the construction. Over time, the operation and maintenance of buildings relied on the ability to sustain these environmental and social resources too. Moreover, food and celebration are also part of the process of building because they strengthen the social ties and the materials used to be replenished years or sometimes generations in advance. Knowledge and craft are passed on generations in the form of stories and collective work, creating conditions for deliberative process necessary to question how we live together. Through mutual support, we can approach architecture as a process rather than a static object. This is a process where everyone contributes from developing shared ideas on what is needed and how to realize those ideas to the actual making and living with what has been built. It is a process of mutualism where an architect is one of many contributors and critically, the agencies of those who give meaning to the built environment become central to the entire process. In this context, it becomes necessary to change the question from what architecture is to what architecture does over time. Such an approach requires us to discuss the impact of a building beyond its completion, where every decision made in the process of creating a building influences the outcome. And we believe mutual support offers a platform to make these decisions together. So if we build through a process of mutual support, what outcomes can we expect beyond the build output itself? Hans Gotte, our mentor, proposed three attributes to consider the outcome of a built object. Firstly, the material quality of building reflects the capacity to sustain and transform its physical and functional features over time. Secondly, the symbolic quality of a building derives from people's relationship to it. A building can be seen as an embodiment of the stories and meanings ever carried by those who relate to it. Thirdly, the strategic quality is represented in how a building affects its surrounding environment in the long run. Historically, the disaster-prone conditions of the Philippines have necessitated a means of a cooperation and sharing of risks through mutual support. So the Filipino tradition of mutual support is called Bayanihan, and it has played an important role in the lives of rural communities as a form of obligated reciprocity consisting of hard labor. So within the informal settlements of Tacloban in the Philippines, shown here, many of the families have come from rural Samar and have practiced these traditions before. So about 10 years ago, we were invited to design and build a study center for this community and the NGO called Streetlight. The facilities will provide healthcare and educational support for the children, but also a home for those living on the street. We worked closely with the families through the design and building process of the study center. They later described this process using the Filipino term by the, princip the principles of which were really strikingly similar to the Norwegian tradition of Dugnan. So having built something through Bayanihan meant that the study center was not just a building to the community. It had become a symbol of the relationships built in the process and the efforts the parents had made for their children. Strategically, the process of organizing through mutual support meant that after the completion, they had also managed to operate the building through the same methods. The material attributes of the building was derived from how they built their houses. And in the years that followed, they would adapt and modify according to this logic. But on the 8th of November, 2013, Super Typhoon Haiyan, one of the strongest typhoons to ever hit land, destroyed more than 4 million households and claimed thousands of lives. The staff and children of Streetlight survived by climbing onto a nearby roof. You can see that on the image here to the left. 
From there, they could see the waves caused by the typhoon flattening the informal settlement and the study center itself. Immediate relief and disaster reconstructions are chaotic moments. Everything has been upturned and the urgency of the situation fosters quick decisions that in the long term can prove to be inadequate or even damaging. Who makes this decision for whom and based on what information are important questions to ask. Often reconstruction efforts emphasize the material attributes of what we spoke about earlier. However, the symbolic and strategic ones are as important, if not even more. The process of working together through by Neon before the typhoon provided a platform for the families to come together again after the disaster to build back their own houses, but also their own lives. Utilizing this platform, a core group was elected to facilitate workshops to allow also build back the study center, office, and orphanage. In this process, the community deliberated through storytelling, role playing, drawing, model making, mapping, and mock ups. Through the workshop process, we realized that the typhoon left a deep psychological trauma that the community was still dealing with. The focus on the material reconstruction often neglects this trauma. In response to their experience of the typhoon, the community identified two dual concepts of open and light and closed and safe. The heavy concrete volumes were designed to provide refuge during typhoons, while the ventilated light timber structures provide natural ventilation that also allows strong winds to pass through the building. The material attributes of the building were defined by these two concepts. The chosen construction methods were deliberatively simple in order to enable the community to gain ownership of the entire process from design to construction and beyond. To be conscious about the material attributes of a project in the input phase is crucial to ensure that the building fits available resources and skills of the people we work with. Over time, uh, maintenance or possible transformations will be required. And if a calamity occurs, the capacity to respond quickly is there. So when all put together, the various elements of the building form a cohesive framework that the community can inhabit. So this is the main living room of the orphanage. You can see that the loft space above for the bedrooms and the service spaces located inside the concrete blocks on the ground floor. The large screen doors and windows can be opened to form a naturally ventilated recreational space. The office consists of three heavy volumes containing meeting rooms and utility spaces. The shared workspaces are located in the areas in between. And at times, this building also functions as a vocational training center. So the study center has teacher's offices, a music room, a library, a kitchen, and bathrooms in the heavy volumes. And it has, classroom, and it has classrooms with areas for song, dance, and theater in the spaces in between. So as such, this is also the public space of Streetlight, and it's the space that connects them with the larger community of Tagpuro. So through this project, we came to realize that the essence of architecture is not space, but instead, it is the meaning ascribed to space. This architecture becomes a part of the community only, it becomes, only when it becomes a symbol of the values, knowledge, and relationships built in the process of its creation. So um, for the San Paolo Biennale, a group of 11 migrants share their personal and collective stories of invisible borders within their daily lives. By situating one's own experience in relation to others, their stories were translated into symbols and patterns on a series of banners that were installed at strategic metro stations. This one in the bottom left states, listen to us, we are here. I was installed at the political center of Sao Paulo. The symbols express voice, neglect, and the need to be heard. This process uh, was inspired by the Brazilian tradition of mutual support called Metirao. Traditions of mutual support are historically based on oral exchange of knowledge and experience. Therefore, storytelling can be an important tool to build a shared understanding in the input phase. Storytelling is about sharing one's personal experience and finding something in common with others. Personal and collective storytelling can generate new narratives, goals, and collective actions. To build a collective story can be a challenge. In some cases, people are very aware of their own story, but not how this situation relates to others in their community. Stories need to be told face to face so that this connection between the individual and collective can be found and a shared understanding can emerge. As each member of the group shared their own story, other members of the group will take on the role of listening or writing. The person writing will try to capture the story in its entirety to make a physical document that the group could revisit later if needed. 
As is often the case, the person telling the story will struggle to remember later what they said. So this document is useful in that regard. These roles rotate between each member of the team and allow for different perspectives to merge in the process that generate important discussions about what was said and what was heard. From this discussion, a shared story was created within each group, addressing issues such as health, language, social assistance, education, and housing. By translating these stories into symbols and patterns, the stories became not only an account of a situation as it is today, but also a call for change. The creative act of drawing helped the members discover and conceptualize their experiences in ways that made it re relatable to other members in the group. Simultaneously, differences and frictions that were hard to reconcile in text were allowed to coexist in the ambiguity of a drawing. It was important that the migrant group that voiced their opinions were also involved in actual making of the banners. Their message is transformed once we engaged in the making and once we had created something together, we had a language to communicate ideas and concepts that we couldn't have had but just talking. One important reflection was Nancy's understanding of knowledge and of community as defined by exclusion or inclusion, something she had experienced herself. Through her painting, she explained that having something in common means that you are on the inside of a group. And if you don't, you're on the outside. These are invisible borders that we draw around ourselves. The outcome of this process gener generated a strong unity and ownership amongst those involved in the process. So much so that the banners became an important part of the migrant march down Palista Avenue, calling for legislative change for the rights of migrants in Sao Paulo. The objects we make become collective representation of the ideas, values, and meanings embedded in the process. This requires externalizing one's own thoughts so they can be discussed and processed together with others. This is a collective process of deliberation and, be and beyond storytelling, you know, there are multiple forms of communication that we use to explore these ideas. So in Vietnam, the tradition of Doi Kong structured our collaboration to design and build a textile cooperative in the village of Lung Tang. Through intensive sessions organized between planting and harvest seasons, the cooperative members mapped their existing facilities and developed a new design for the site, which we then tested through a small prototype. So although space can be illustrated through architectural tools and methods, the way that it functions can be best understood through simpler and more direct methods, such as role playing, singing, painting, or even storytelling. Each workshop is centered around an activity that explores a particular topic through the creation of output that is presented and deliberated together. Through these alternative forms of communication, we go beyond the constraints of language and allow feelings and ideas to be expressed and discussed more openly and more directly. So similar to our work in Sao Paulo, storytelling can be an important tool to understand how we perceive our situation, both individually and as a collective. In Lung Tang, we shared stories about the spaces where we live and the symbols that are meaningful in Hmong culture. We're able to build a common understanding about the qualities of space we are talking about when, you, when we have a clear reference that everyone can relate to. The symbols that were shared have common meanings that they also make their way into the patterns that they create on the textiles. So mapping is an act of organizing, categorizing, and establishing relationships between different elements of an environment. So we did a series of walkthroughs around the community to draw different house typologies that we found around the village. This allowed us to categorize and analyze them together and find what we could like to capture in the spaces and what we'd like to create for the cooperative. We also mapped out the plan of the existing cooperative to document how the space was used and also to categorize the process, their, their design process into different zones. This allowed us a way to talk about the relationship of these zones and how they can be configured in the final design. This drawing helps to identify and transform stories and ideas into physical representations that can be documented, discussed, and developed collectively. The plans that were created were discussed, uh, the different floor plans and the plan options for the building became a common reference for us to improve on the decisions made as a group. The logic of the structural grid in the vernacular wooden houses became a precedent for the way that the cooperative members discussed and drew the new floor plans for the cooperative. Role-playing is a bodily expression of, expression of an idea, an issue, or a lived experience. Acting this out or being a spectator offers both an inside and outside view of a given topic. It also gives a sense of scale and can be a great way to understand the size of a room or a space. After drawing floor plans on paper, 
it became quite clear that we had to test this out in full scale before we actually are able to finalize the design. We used some rope to stake out a plan on an open area near the site and acted out how the space would be used in the equipment uh, with the equipment that they needed for each function. Uh, the result of this role playing was a lively discussion about how the space could be used. Model making enables the translation of ideas, programs, and concepts into space. While role playing or mock ups offer a very concrete experience of the building, a scale model offers a more abstract overview of the project. This allows us to deliberate on the configuration of the various zones and functions within the space, as well as to make a connection between the existing facility and the future facility. The scale model also allowed us to a way to discuss building elements and construction systems that relate to their vernacular architecture. Mocking up in full scale helps to translate abstract ideas, drawings, and models into concrete examples. We also built a full scale uh, window using cardboard so that we could understand the relationship of the working space to the facade in terms of the functionality of the different window configurations. In order to put into practice all the skills we have formed as a group, we built a small shed that serves as a place to showcase their textiles, as well as a space to demonstrate the weaving process, both um, for the children in the village and also for some tourists who are visiting. This shed mock-up also becomes a reference for us to build upon in order to talk about the tectonics of the final structure that we hope to build together. The design for the new cooperative consists of reused wooden houses kept since the Vietnam War, and these structural members that were brought with them during the forced relocation from the hilltops down to the bottom of the valley. This move has exposed them to landslides and high risks of flash floods, unfortunately. And the design therefore carries a symbolic importance to the community, passing down the history of the relocation while also housing the craft that they cherish the most. For our project in Oslo, we focus on two particular strands of the Norwegian tradition of mutual support, Dugnad. That is the Dugnad of ideas and the Dugnad of construction. As part of a broad popular movement addressing health, litigation, religion, trade unions, and so on, the idea Dugnad played the central role in bringing people together to form the Norwegian welfare state. These are grassroots movements organized to discuss and act on pressing issues and challenges of the time. As people were in need of a place to gather, to discuss ideas, beliefs, and also politics, it became important how the facilities needed for these discussions. Some of these buildings, also known as Grendehus, were community centers often built through Dugnad of construction. Together with the municipality and the residents of Slettelukka, uh, where the project takes place, we initiated a series of Dugnads to program and renovate a vacant space in Slettelukka into a community center. Exploring the concept of Dugnad is important in the context of Norway, where participation and citizen engagement is often reduced to a consultation process where power still lies in the hands of the developer or the politician. Exploring how platforms of mutual support can facilitate this mutual exchange between different stakeholders, we hope to find a way in which urban development can start with the intent of the people rather than the speculative interests of the politician or developer. The challenge we found in organizing Dugnad sessions in Oslo every second weekend was to ensure the proper outreach, to engage those that normally do not engage in public de deliberation, as well as to ensure that this participation fostered a commitment to move, come back the following weekend. When new people joined, we also need to find ways to bring them up to speed on the state of the discourse and making process without relapsing into an issue that was already discussed and resolved. The act of making object that can be displayed and presented easily by each and everyone that took part in the making of it allows for this process of involving people as they join, as well as to ensure that anyone within the group can take on the role of updating newcomers. This example here is a key used to program the activities of the Grand Hus, its key programs and its key individuals that will take responsibility for the different programs and their operation. Uh, as we moved on to the construction dugnads, the head of the municipality task group and the most active residents would engage in weekly meetings to define, schedule, and delegate the work that had been done. Tasks that went beyond the expertise of the people in the group would be delegated to skilled uh, labor that would be paid to implement the task. Um, in the picture here, you have Maria Orton, which uh, has been a very close partner and collaborator with me and Sudar on this project. 
Again, the act of translating an idea into a physical intervention can be powerful. And many of the residents explain that they have never known that they could achieve or realize some of the tasks they took on. This uh, building is set to be completed now uh, in October. It's been delayed due to COVID. So that will be a big celebration when it's open. So together with the team of the Japanese pavilion uh, of the Venice Biennale 2021, uh, and the residents of the northern part of Shetlaka, we are now developing a new meeting space by reusing an old greenhouse uh, in the area and reassembling the Japanese house that's been exhibited uh, for the duration of the Biennale in Venice. So this is very exciting and we're looking forward to this. So to address the theme of the Venice Architecture Biennale, how will we live together? We teamed up with a community in Angat, Philippines that practices Bayanihan as part of the way of life. Through this six-step process, we designed and built a library and a conflict resolution space in response to the need for privacy and security brought by the dense living conditions. So this building is now exhibited in Venice and will return home to the village after the Biennale. So in order to really structure the input phase of a process, we have developed a six-step method that creates space for this mutual exchange of knowledge. So first, it's about learning about the context, values, and culture that the community shares. And second, we collectively question how we develop these in relation to shared ambitions. Third, it's about making something that suggests how we can transform, transform the current situation. These steps are aimed at creating a concept that can act as a common language within the group. This common language allows us to design and build something together that comes from and belongs to the community. So in a way, we like to see this process as a cycle since this knowledge becomes part of the community so that they may build upon and develop on this in the future. So the aim of the learning phase was always to reflect on what it means to live together. The values and worldviews important to the community were explored to guide the following discussions. So learning focused on themes of life, of work, and place grounded in people's experiences. So first, learning about each other's ambitions and values by drawing a heart that is filled with what matters to each one. And second, it's about learning about the place by drawing a map of the village itself and the surrounding areas. And third, it's about learning about ways of working together through personal and shared stories of Bayanihan. The aim of the questioning phase was to reflect on the challenges that we live, that we face together. The situation identified uh, in the learning phase was critically examined for its strengths and weaknesses by personifying the village and acting out the situation. You can see them here acting out a play wherein the typhoon comes and then the community stick, gets to stick together. And you can see also that they, these, all these processes are deliberated together with each other. So we imagine the weaknesses as tree trunks also, and the groups identified the roots causes and how the problems branched out and impacted their lives. So these reflections form the basis to propose interventions that could address root causes. So the aim of the making phase was to explore ways to work together and do something about our ambitions and problems. The program of the future building was decided upon through interviews within the group, as well as the wider community. The mock-up is a scoreboard located adjacent to the basketball court. It was designed and built uh, to test the construction skills within the community and the availability of the materials. The aim of the concept phase was to develop a common language for us to communicate, evaluate, and transform ideas into a design. The common language emerged through the use of the concept of a grid, as well as the Filipino concept of space called maaliwalas, which means it's a word that describes spaces which are bright, open, well-ventilated and light. Through workshops, a shared understanding of maaliwalas was developed by identifying local references and documenting them. The grid was used to move between different scales to budget the size of each program and draw the spaces needed for the different activities and as well as to locate them on a site plan. The aim of the design phase, next. Yeah, the aim of the design phase was to use the concepts to, to, to design the space, the structure, the location of the interiors and exteriors of the building. Placing the buildings on the grid on site, the program locations were adjusted. The structures and roofing in the building were explored through models and full-scale testing. By definition, by defining some core parameters such as access, appearance, security, privacy, and ventilation, the final decision on the location and plan of the building were made on the site. 
So the concept of maliwalas became the common language which allowed us to design the doors and windows, as well as the roof shape and also how the building meets the ground. So the aim of the building phase was to develop the design in detail and to prototype solutions in full scale. These workshops were used as a platform to test and develop different building elements of the library, such as the doors, the windows, and the integrated shelves. Carpenters from the village took the lead and developed this process to measure, cut, and mount the elements with, it, with accuracy required for the structure to be disassembled and reassembled in Venice. So this is now the structure as it was before we shifted to Venice. And uh, you can see also the parts there being um, laid out on site beside the community. So after setting up in Bulacan, uh, we shipped our pavilion to Venice in order to install it for the opening of the 2021 Biennale. We saw the mounting of the pavilion as an opportunity to engage with a different community altogether. So that of the contractors in Venice and also with the Filipino community there. So in a way, the transportation of the pavilion across nations also mirrors the original concept of Bayonihan in that people transfer a building from one place to another through the help of the communities around them. So the library is configured to fit the both context, contexts of the site in Bulacan and at the Arsenale in Venice. So we thought it was really critical to represent the voices and the effort of the community from the Philippines by bringing the actual piece and actual product of their work to Venice. We also created this library as a living space where people are invited to contribute stories about mutual support and it will be displayed in the library as an exhibition inside, inside it. So the analogy often used in relation to mutual support practices around the world is the idea of lifting something together. In Norway, Dugnad is described as a collective lift. Uh, in the Philippines, Bainian is associated with the idea of lifting a house from one village to another. The capitalist exploitation in the 20, early 20th century was also illustrated with the concept of the laboring class lifting the rest of society on their shoulders. It's crucial that we now ask ourselves, what are we lifting and for whom? What values does our architecture represent and promote? And are these worth lifting? Thank you so much. That's, uh, that's what we have. That's <laughs> if, um, if there's any questions, we can do that now, if you like. Um, Thank you. Um, there is one question on the uh, link. Uh, I'd like to read it, um, just a moment. Uh, two, two posts, there are, there are two, two, two posts. The buildings designed by the lecturers have very delicate designs, but are the residents involved in this design as well? Mm -hmm. That's the first question. Yeah, you wanna go? I, I, yeah, yeah, I can answer that. Yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, the, we work very, very closely with the with the workers from the community. So that building particularly in Venice uh, was developed with the workers themselves. So everything was built on site and even the design of the individual elements, even the pattern of the windows, even the jointing details were actually done within the resources that we had available on site. So we think actually that, you know, um, architects also of course have a particular kind of knowledge that we can share, but the community also has their own knowledge that they share with us. So we think that really, sharing our knowledge to the community and them sharing their knowledge with us forms a much richer um, design language that, that is developed um, through a process which is, is um, generated by a platform for exchanging of it. So, so we really think that, um, yeah, it is definitely an exchange of knowledge that allowed for this design to be done together. Yeah, I also feel that there is a gap between the uh, nature of the project which, may, uh, which I mean the residents participating and the high quality of the design. Is there something that the Sudan and Alex, we have done differently or just, 
do you have something uh, original method to read such a uh, high quality design? Um, I mean, I think a lot of the, the process and um, that we go through is to kind of get at what kind of expertise we're working with uh, in the places we work. So in some cases, you know, you have people that are extremely skilled at certain uh, ways of building or techniques, and it's about lifting those skills up. Uh, so this process can take long, can take some time. And we build tests and we do prototypes before we eventually build the final thing. So, I mean, I think it's important when you do community work that the, the result of what you create is at a good standard also. It doesn't need uh, to mean when you do community and collaborative mm -hmm. design that it shouldn't be good architecture. And I think that that should, that should be something that we need to try to achieve as architects is to elevate the quality of the work that we do together so that their efforts and their skills and values can really be seen as something quite valuable. Yeah. Thank you. And there are three more posts yeah. uh, on, on your question. And the second one, how does the project start? And could you explain the framework of the project, including funding, clients, operations, et cetera? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, in terms of this, I think um, in terms of the structure, like the larger structure of how projects are done, it really varies depending on the, the type of project that we're working with. Sometimes it's funded by the, um, you know, the government. In this case of the Bulacan project in Venice, it is funded by the Philippine government. So we use the funds to create a project with the community. In other cases, it is funded by the organization itself. So whether it be an NGO or the cooperative, that they have their own funds to do this project. Um, so what we always try, try to do within all our projects is to be contributing to an organization which is already running. So we don't create the projects from scratch and we are contributing to something more than creating something um, brand new, basically. So I think it's about um, seeing how we can add to that and uh, keep, like, keep a moving train going rather than you know, pushing it to start, something like this. I would add that it's important that um, we, we do say no to projects also. So if the conditions are not there, that we can actually engage directly with the community in and through the process that kind of mutual support uh, makes possible, then we won't do the project. Uh, I think the starting point often when we do start the kind of early discussion about how we're going to work together is to talk about mutual support because the premises and the knowledge that goes into these traditions are you know, it's really the core of what me and Sura is trying to understand in terms of how you start and plan and, and program a design process with directly with the community. Yeah. yeah thank you. And everyone, you can, of course, uh, have a dialogue directory via Zoom. So after I read the questions, please uh, react something uh, if you want to uh, have a question to them. And the third question, um, how does the project, oh, sorry, um, this, this was finished. Are there moments when the residents want, wants are under undesirable from an architecture point of view? If so, how would you reconcile those conflicts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll answer. <laughs> okay, so, so like even for particularly for the project of Streetlight, um, when they initially had discussions with them, they said, yeah, offhand, you know, we want Corinthian columns, or sort of Doric columns, uh, and we want a classical building. So to us, um, initially as an architect, we, we feel like there's a bias against uh, doing that uh, offhand. But we felt like there must be something beyond this idea, which, which makes them want to have um, Doric columns. And we, we went through the workshop process and tried to understand what was behind that thought. And what we discovered was it's that they wanted something strong. They wanted something which um, reflected stability. And that's, of course, due to this fact that they, that they went through this psychological trauma of going through the typhoons and seeing buildings washed away. So they, the symbols which, and the meanings which they attach to, to those columns can be, of course, expressed in different ways. And we help them see that through the process, through going through the workshops and then Effectively, that's what we use to be able to abstract the concepts a little bit and get at them using a different architectural language. 
I think uh, another example also Sudar, is the one from Bulacan in terms of the location ah. of the building. <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. We did a uh, for the Venice Biennale. We did the project, the the building. We did the library. We did. We we had a long discussion about where the building is going to be and in what orientation. And of course, me and Suda, we have a preference. You know, we thought it would be beautiful to put the building next to the basketball court so that it would be activated by the sports, but at the same time create another kind of type of space on the other side. But the community really, really did not want to put it in that location. Had many other ideas of where it would go. So. I think what's important is to kind of like the question for us is then how do you make decision and on what premises do we make these decisions? So we we went through a process where we kind of reasoned out and mapped out the different location and different members of the community would kind of, you know, reason to or give an argument as to why that location was good and so on. And eventually we voted, but with the idea of actually always having the argument next to the vote. So that way, at the end of the day, we had come to a location that we didn't really necessarily want but after a while actually became very logical so i think the the idea that they had was much better but but we didn't see it at the time and i think that when we do architectural projects and we design together we need to know or we need to acknowledge that we don't always have the right answer and that we might actually need to learn something also in the process of working with people so that it is a generally a mutual learning process we cannot be too strong about our opinions either. Exactly. Yeah. Is the questioner satisfied? If not, please open your mic. Okay. Okay. The yeah, next question. Um, uh, next question. Memory of events or the past can be so different for different people. Can you please elaborate more on the role of architecture in memorialization and healing? I think, I think it's a, do you wanna go to that or should I? Go ahead, go ahead, yeah. I think it's, it's so true that, you know, any memory or a description of a situation would differ amongst everyone that's, there will be a different understanding of that memory or, but so it's, it's in our process, it's really important to acknowledge that there will be different perspectives and there will be different understandings. So we need to give space for that. And I think that when you are part of creating something, when you create a building or you create an object, that object can contain many values and ideas and meanings and stories. And I think that's the kind of beauty of uh, our built environment is that it can actually uh, inhabit many different perspectives. I don't know if you want to add to that, Sura, but. Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, there, there are many ways to interpret the same thing. And that's kind of the postmodern condition that, that we have always um, been existing in. And I'd just like to add an example, maybe. It's, it's to do really with, the, again, going back to the street light project. When, they, when the community was looking for the symbol of what was strong and what was uh, safe and stable, there was an existing um, play castle made out of concrete that was existing on the playground which did not get washed away by the, by the typhoon. So they felt like that symbolizes kind of strength. And of course, that's a very particular interpretation of, of that, uh, that condition. But I think it does then feed into the concept of what, what is meaningful to the community and what becomes structured as a way to kind of create the, the design in the, in the future. At the same time, the, the memory also of, you know, like the, the GI sheets that were flying around the, during the typhoon and um, injuring people and destroying property. Um, that was something that was very traumatic to the people uh, in, the, in, the, in the community. So they specifically banned that material from being used. So we had to think of alternative um, a roofing system that would not be using this corrugated GI roof sheets. So, I mean, the, the, the role of memory definitely um, relates to how something means something to more people. And hopefully, you know, that helps to structure the design that is meaningful to, to the community. And I think that diagram that we're trying to show um, that talks about how an output is shaped by the input, and that input then generates a different outcome. So, you know, if you talk about the symbolic value of an object, it really, really does affect how a building is used afterwards. Uh, and that's what Sudo here is, you know, referring to, which I think it's crucial. Yeah. Okay. The next question. Okay. 
Um, thank you for the presentation. The Philippine Pavilion is an antithesis to horizon mania. How can this movement become the future mainstream architecture? <laughs> yeah, well, I think, you know, I think it's really, I mean, these structures of mutual support exist already around the world. And it's about learning from how these traditional ways of living together can inform the way that we practice architecture already. So I think it makes it much easier to, to kind of um, integrate that into our design process once we become aware that these, these structures already exist. And so why not use the things which are around us to move forward and kind of see how we can improve the way that we are currently living together already. So, so I think um, it is possible and a lot of us can use it. And it doesn't mean that necessarily we have to replace the existing structure, but more about how we can improve our own design processes and our own building methods to incorporate this, these ideas already. So it's very possible and it already is existing, I think. So more people should do it, I think, or at least try and consider the implications of that. Alex. Well, I mean, uh, I, I, yeah, I, you captured it, so I think. <laughs> because it's really like, uh, I think I grew up practicing to not, uh, you know, I, it's been part of my life. Uh, and somehow I didn't recognize it as something important until I experienced it in the Philippines. So I think it's like to bring attention to the practices that are not necessarily constrained by the capitalist system, but to look at what other forms of organization do you have and understandings of value do you already have that would then give shape to other type of building. So, so I, and I think we already have it. We already have it in most cultures. We just need to bring attention to it. And that's, that's what Sudan and I are really trying to do with the Philippine pavilions to say, it's already there. Let's just try and test it out and see how that works and what our role as architects can be within that. Yeah. Very inspiring. So it's time to start some direct dialogue. Uh, do you have any question? Or uh, <laughs> I would like to ask someone to comment on this. Uh, cute, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> okay, Lionel. Huh? Please open your mic. I'll hello. hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Okay. Yes, we can Hi. hear. You. Okay. Um. I like to first um, say that your projects are very nice. They're very and they're very uh, pedagogically um, inclined, you know. So it's uh, it's a lot of teaching by using hands and stuff like that. Yeah. So um, one of my questions is because your practice is very international, from Philippines to um, the Norway, and you have projects in is it, what was it Myanmar? I don't remember. Vietnam. Yeah. yeah Vietnam. Yes. Yeah. So um, how do you like um? Like in terms of a communication and in terms of com um community um interaction and stuff like that, how do you ensure like um efficient like interaction and and communication in a sense because it 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 some some sometimes something that works in Philippines or where I'm from mm -hmm. in Malaysia it, it might not work in somewhere else you know yeah. mm -hmm. so so how how do you actually ensure that in and mediate that in a way. I mean, I, I think every project would be organized. Every project we do is organized differently depending on who we work with, uh, what's the community and how they make decisions and how they meet and how they uh, do things together. We also try to build a little team of creative practitioners around the project within the country we work. So in Brazil, we've been working in the Goma Oficina, which is fantastic. They're like a creative arts group. Um, you know, and also we have Maria Orton, we have Matthias Josefsson, we have creative practitioners and the idea is that this collaboration happens on two levels with the community, but also amongst uh, our peers. Um, so language itself, you know, Sudan and I have worked through, uh, you know, when they talk about the spoken language, there is, uh, we do have translators in some cases, and yeah, a lot is lost in the translation but a lot, lot is also communicated in the act of doing things. So I think the, the a very important thing for me as Sudra is how we communicate through action and how we communicate through doing things and how we reason around the things that we have made. And, and that as form of communication will, you know, I think independently of where you are in the world, I think that's quite a human way of, of uh, doing things uh, in our surroundings for ourselves to understand things. That's how we work 
pedagogically, I think. So that's kind of where we try to dig deeper and understand more in what we do. Yeah, I'd like to give an example also. So going back to this uh, example in Vietnam, so we were working with a community in Lung Tam, which is a uh, village which is about 12 hours north of Hanoi. So um, there is obviously a language barrier between ourselves and uh, the Vietnamese team, our, our Vietnamese partners, who are also architects and uh, like a community organizer that we're working with there. So we have a team, which is our community of people who are kind of doing the project also, which is separate from the community that we're working with. Um, the community that we're working with speaks a language called Hmong, which is um, also not the same as Vietnamese. It's like a totally different language. So we have to translate our instructions or our discussions sometimes from English to Vietnamese and from Vietnamese to Hmong. So effectively, there is really no clear and direct way to communicate through, through language. And so that really highlights the importance of creating objects and creating drawings and acting things out uh, physically and using other forms of communication that allow us to, to get the project done and create this mutual understanding between the teams and the different teams through the, the barriers of this language. And if you speak about mutual support, the idea is not necessarily that the discussions between us as architects and the community as the other group is mutually amongst every person that's there present. So a lot of the reasoning happens amongst the people that is part of the workshop and eventually we'll get an idea of what was being discussed. But, you know, that's not necessarily that we need to know everything either that is being kind of deliberated. It's, it's, um, it's between everyone that's there kind of thing. Thank you. That's a very that's very interesting. Um, if if I may ask, uh, like, how do you actually get these international projects? Like, do they approach you, or like, or do you like advertise yourself, or how does it's it? Different. It differs. It differs for each project. Uh, but you know, it's like a snowball. One project leads to, leads to the next one. You know, it you know it accumulates, and people hear about what you do, and uh, and then reach out for for more projects. Yeah. Other times you meet people that you really, you know, you, you really like and you really want to do something together and then you push to create something with them. Uh, you know, I'm very excited about what we're going to try to achieve in Oslo, for example, uh, where we're really actively going in to try to find sources. Uh, we're getting cultural funds now to fund the project that we're going to do with the Japanese pavilion um, because we really want that project to happen. So in some cases we're being pulled in, sometimes we're actually working towards it. So uh, these are different kind of uh, differs always i think yeah yeah in some cases yes you you do have to apply for a lot of grants but also in in situations like this in lectures in in conferences we do meet a lot of people and it's a good way to really create a network and so you know like they say if the opportunity and uh, it's come the more that you the opportunities come the more that you try and reach out and kind of create this system around you which which draws it in somehow and there's a flow that happens when that, whenever these things are are published or, or are shared in lectures and in other things. So I think that's really I, the way that it happens. And I think as, as, as architects, or uh, we are also a community uh, and we're not just individuals and pay, uh, you know firms and companies all working independently. We can also, also establish uh, structures of mutual support or mutual support platforms to do collaborations together. And I think that's also really exciting sometimes because very often when you practice, you might be in a very specific context, but you know, by collaborating, we can actually engage in different contexts and, and learn from each other also. So we're also a community that can collaborate, create projects. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you, Thank you Neil. So any other question? Okay, um, can I? Uh, uh, I'd like to introduce Kiyu-san. Uh, he is a Toshikatsu Kiyuchi, an architect, and we are collaborating now because uh, Kiyuchi-san is an exhibiting architect of Japan Pavilion at the current Venice Vienna. So please give uh, your feedback. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, thank you for the comprehensive lecture. Now, you know, I have an overall understanding of your, you know, projects, you know, which is very nice. And... Um, um, I ask this question uh, because, as uh, you know, Kadwaki-san said, uh, 
I'm gonna work on the project with you, you know, using, you know, the Japanese pavilion, you know, as a material, you know, for, you know, Oslo project, you know, which is, I think, a challenge. And um, uh, what I became very interested in, you know, today uh, was um, the actual, uh, how do I say, the process or procedure and you know, how, like, you know, design can be developed, you know, from uh, discussion with uh, non-professional people or uh, facing, you know, the very local situation or local materials. And uh, I think, you know, that it's, it's going to be very interesting in how the people in Oslo will see, like in the Japanese, you know, pavilion materials and how they understand and what can happen, you know, uh, starting, you know, from uh, this, uh, point. So um, maybe the question can be like, um, I think, you know, the architect is good at, you know, uh, controlling abstraction and, you know, uh, understanding concreteness mm -hmm. and then, you know, make it into, you know, design. But uh, can you maybe give us, you know, some example, M maybe the uh, project of, you know, uh, the making symbols, you know, was a uh, could be a hint. So maybe if you can give uh, us a uh, example of how, like you know, uh, uh, this you know, a uh, talking or discussion between people become yeah. exact you know design output, and then you know the symbol you know uh, case you know could be maybe easy to understand <laughs> and then, you know, okay. good to discuss with, I thought, you know, so that's why, you know, I uh, picked up, you know, this project, you know, from your lecture, but can right. you, yeah, give us an example. Sure. Alex, would you like to start with uh, Sao Paulo? I, I could add stuff about in Bulacan also after you. Yeah. I, I, I think also this is why we, you know, figured we should show this one for Brazil because this really is a condensed idea, mm -hmm. a, a smaller uh, kind of expression of what it means to create an idea together and then implement it. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, in this specific case, you know, we're working with a community that has a lot to say. They have so many things that they want to express, you know. Uh -huh. And, you know, if you start a conversation, you, 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 you don't know, you can't move. You just need to take it all in because they have so much experiences and knowledge. The trick is to make that into a shared experience, right? Mm. So... In this specific project, we're, we're talking about at the outset about storytelling because there, there's this verbal, uh, you know, uh, capacity amongst the people we work with. Now, how do we turn that into a collective uh, expression or story or mm -hmm. an idea that says something about us as a group? Uh, and I think a lot of them had this kind of feeling of an invisible border that they faced in their everyday. Mm -hmm. They had crossed the national border, a very physical one. And they come in, but they keep facing these invisible walls. The process then became about within the platform of Mutirao, of meeting face to face, you know, sharing our individual stories. But in doing that, actually making the situation a little bit different, a little bit strange, you know. So we took on roles. So we have one person is the storyteller, one person is listening passively. That person doesn't speak, cannot respond, just observe. Mm -hmm. And a third per person takes on uh, an active listener role. So this person, he empathizes. He helps the person bring the story out and so on. And the third person writes it down. So for everything we do, it cannot just be um, a flimsy. It needs to be a physical thing that we can come back to later. So each of them managed to kind of manifest their own personal stories into these written descriptions of it. But having had this role of being a passive and active listener, they also knew what the story really was about this time. They hadn't just been like blown over by these experiences, they actually had listened. Mm. Based on that, they can actually start to rewrite the story and create a shared story. And that was really interesting, but it was difficult because when you work in text, it's still talking. So you have conflicting interests. And so we mm. start taking, you know, we bring out some textile, we bring out some tape and we say, let's try to translate ideas in these stories into symbols. And they did many, you know, they did that circle with the circle inside by Nancy. That's, that's one in the long process of translating elements of their story into uh, other kind of abstract ideas. And in the process of doing these different symbols, they'd be like, oh yeah, I can relate to that. Because in mm. my story, it's very similar. 
So you're, you're going through that process and they're abstracting their own experience into these symbols. Then when you start combining these symbols again, you can rewrite the stories through the physical things that you make through these kind of symbols. That mm-hmm. creates a new shared narrative that is collective that became these banners that they are actually using in the Metro to tell other migrants that, hey, don't be scared, but say what you need, you know, or tell the government to listen to us or, you know, so they were very powerful. That's why the, then, you know, the unexpected things happen that the thing you make becomes something more than you expected. So it became a part of the demonstration. Hmm. But as I think that this kind of slow process and working with the capacities and skills of the group of the people that you work with, but to make sure that there's always a physical output at least for mm. us, it's really important that there is a physical output at the end of the day, something that we can put on the floor next to the other outputs and compare. Mm. And then based on that, make something new. Based on that, make something new. But at the end of the day, you created something that contains so much meaning, so much story, so much process. And I think this relates a lot to your pavilion also, because mm. the trajectory of elements is really about the story that a piece of I mean, um, yeah, yeah. This is, I mean, I shouldn't say what it's about, but I mean, like, it's, it's really telling a lot about the material and the stories and the experience that each member has, mm-hmm. the life it's lived and the trajectory it's on. And I think that in everything we do as architects and with communities, we need to somehow and make sure that we're not producing products or objects that are static, but we are continuing a process of life and different forms of expression of that. So that's mm-hmm. the kind of not very short answer sorry <laughs> <laughs> I, I, i'd like to add to that also um, yeah, yeah alex could you share again the like page 38 of the of our presentation it's pretty easy. It, yeah yeah uh, okay that didn't work i'm gonna try one more time sorry yeah as I'd like to share something a little bit about the, you know, like yeah, in, yeah. in architect, the architectural uh, mm. version of, of that also. So, yeah. It's the ah, Bulacan. Okay. Yeah. Can you say which slide? Because I don't see the yeah, number. Just again. before this one, this slide, after, make, after making concept. Wait, it's moving. I pushed too many times. No. <laughs> Wait, after in the questioning, making face. Yes. After making. Yeah. After making design. Concept. concept. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. So if you if you take a look at this, I mean, I think you know, architecture is a very physical activity and it's a very practical one too. So so I think the understanding of tectonics and the understanding of design actually is is innate within a lot of within most people because of course we all have an understanding of space. We all have an understanding of structure somehow natively. Mm-hmm. But I think you know when we talk about the architecture then. I think somehow the way that you know, architects talk about it, it maybe is too complicated for other people to understand. But if we simplify you know, the way that we talk about architecture, people are able to understand and also relate to it in a way that's, that's native to them. So uh, instead of like talking about you know, meters and feet and, and things like this in terms of dimensions, we simplify the process and just created a, a grid module, which is like 1.2 by 1.2 meters wide. And people like are, are able to see the resolution um, in a much simpler way. So you know you don't have to create a very fine resolution uh, object. You just create an, uh, a resolution which is easy enough to understand and easy enough to, to keep track of. So this 1.2 grid module actually is what we use. You see it on the upper right hand side there to to plan the floor plans of the building itself. So that grid helped people understand immediately what that dimension was. And it works in the plan, but it also works in the section. You can see here, this section, people testing out the scale model on site. And at the same time, it also works on the lower left where people are actually testing out the full scale in, in section there. And uh, so people are then more easily able to understand uh, scale to set to a plan in section and also in you know full scale to the actual dimensions on site. Um, at the same time, you know, it's also the tools that we use. So we selected you know, um, popsicle sticks as a model making tool because that actually connects to, to the, you know, the tectonics of using wood or timber as a construction system. So the way that we join the wood is also connected to the tool that we use to communicate these ideas. So if you look closely at the model scale model that they're using there, it's a popsicle stick model 
Now, Alex, could you zoom into that um, the popsicle stick model also? You'll I, see there. I, oh, no, you can't. Okay. But anyway, the tectonics is, is related to how we join the system. And that's mm -hmm. also reflected in the next picture, Alex, uh, of the actual final building. So the, the final building in Venice, you know, the, the bypass system of creating two things, a sandwich mm -hmm. by the other thing, that's, that's actually related integrally to the way that we talked about the design. So, mm. so everything here was really um, shared with and communicated through a language consistent through the, the differences in scale. So I think maybe that's one way by which we can aim to simplify the language of architecture so that everyone can participate. Mm. Thank you. Um, yeah, the already was very inspiring. And then, you know, that each comment, you know, from uh, Alex and, you know, Suda, um, I got a, I don't know, some some hint or <laughs> inspiration, you know, that uh, maybe um, the key, you know, is like, again, the Japanese material will be like completely alien somehow, you know, for you know, mm -hmm. people in Oslo, but um, how to, like you know share the information you know like like uh, history you know of you know those you know elements you know will be very important possibly and then you know how to make it into collective as you said so uh it needs to be shared right you know so maybe the setup you know to share you know those history like uh maybe it could be simply a lecture or you know it could be some you know level of exhibition you know maybe we can try or yeah. uh the comment you know from Sudar you know was also very inspiring uh because like every material you know uh has a reason you know to be there yeah, and then exactly. um maybe yeah we can come back you know to this very simple um uh somehow straightforward uh reason for you know everything you know to be there and then to start you know from that then Again, you know, it can become, you know, collective understanding of, you know, what they are, you know, then uh, from there, you know, of course, every people has different history, you know, of life, right, you know, so, yeah, yeah the how to interpret it into uh, design, you know, can be some discovery, you know, I hope. So, um, from here, you know, I don't know, and, you know, it becomes a challenge, but uh, with you, uh, who is professional, you know, to facilitate you know, those things, um, I'm, yeah, very excited, you know, to see, you know, what, you know, we're going to be working on, you know. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, it was very inspiring. Thanks. I think that's also the kind of the beautiful thing about this. You know, when we start out any of these projects, we really don't know what the result will mm. be. And that's, you know, it's like you're saying, it's a collective process of discovery between ourselves and also with the community because every condition is different and every every community is different too. So mm. like that's the fun part. And you know, we just have to trust that this process will, will create a result that everyone will be happy sure. with. Sure. Mm. Mm. Yeah, maybe maybe we can start from uh, some small construction using, you know, those you know alien material, you know, for everybody yep. to become familiar, you know, with those things. Um, I don't know, but uh, yeah. yeah. You scale up. I think it's a good idea, and it would be a. It's a process where we're starting. Yeah, mm -hmm. exciting. Looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting discussion, and I, I I'd like to ask a question. And can your method be applied to larger buildings or with more complex programs? I, I mean, yeah. I would say so. I mean, it's really about, I mean, what Sir and I is really talking about is a pedagogic approach to how we, we translate ideas into physical form. It doesn't necessarily imply that it has to be small. Uh, so I think the way you structure the process is really how you kind of work at scale. Uh, yeah. I think, and I think for example, when we talk about bigger projects, uh, those uh, phases that we're talking about become more important. A smaller project, you know, less so. Uh, even mm -hmm. though they're still there, they're less expressed. You spend less time at each phase. But to, you know, so I think when you work in bigger institutional projects, or bigger buildings, it's uh, it's about giving enough time to make sure that these different ideas uh, can be given a meaningful shape. Yeah. At the same time, I think it's also about creating like the commitment or having a commitment from a community that you're participating with. So. 
I think um, the process works if the people are also equally engaged in the process and it's not like some anonymous people that you're working with. So if the people can be given the voice to participate and then so that they have the willingness to do so, then for sure, I could imagine this could work for like a much larger community or, or even, you know, to design, like, let's say it's an artist center or a museum of some sorts, like we just have to find which communities are involved or are directly part of the process and who are the stakeholders and who will be represented in the, in, in this museum thing or, or in, in any other um, kind of the process. So the, the concern we have about scale definitely has more to do with participation than it has to do with the actual size of a building. And I mean, we can look at precedents. Uh, in my, where my family is from, which is about uh, three hours away down the fjord here, they built a uh, ice rink, uh, which is, I think, one of the largest ice rinks in the world, uh, through Dugnad. So the whole process was built by the community because they really like uh, ice skating. Uh, one of the Norway's most important ice skaters came from there. So the whole community came together and built this incredibly massive structure. So I think it's about will and it's about the interest and it's about the commitment of the people that you're working with. And I think then really the scale is, uh, everything is possible. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, any other questions? Okay, I, I would like to, I would like uh, for more comments to my colleagues. Muraji Sensei, are you there? Yes. <laughs> Can I give us some comments? Okay, um, thank you very much for a very um, inspiring lecture. I enjoyed a lot. Um, my name is Yutaro. I just started teaching at Major University from this spring. Um, I already actually I already asked the question online, the second question, but maybe I, I can ask another one. Um, it was very um, interesting for me that you work um, as an in individual and also as a collective. And so my question is: Is there any um, is there any particular reason that you work as a collective and how does that um, kind of in, um, influence the practice um, such as participatory planning and, um, you know, um, participatory design project that you do? Want to give it a go, Sudan? Uh, uh, you can even Sorry. go ahead. Are you thinking uh, in terms of how we're working as a collective amongst ourselves, amongst architects, amongst peers, or how we're working as a collective with the communities we work with, or in general, both? Because um, in general, both, but um, I'm interested in like, how you work as a team uh, of an architect. And like, you know, you can also um, group as an organization, but you still work as an individual and, you know, um, differ to project, but you basically work as a collective. So how does that mean to the project, you know, in an essential level? Right, I think all this is very closely connected to the, the method that we use, which is the, the idea of mutual support, uh, which, you know, the, it's interesting to talk about the individual and the collective in that regard, because it's not necessarily a, a dif dif difference between those two, they're very connected. So there's not a dictonomy between the individual and the collective. The identity is kind of somehow expressed in the act of working together. So for Sudar and I, we've been working together, well, say eight years now, Sudar, no? Ten, yeah. ten. Um, and, and I think it's in the act of doing what we do that we are somehow becoming who we are. And in doing that with communities, each project somehow becomes what it is in the context where it is. So it's about the encounter, I think. And that encounter is what we want that building to express and the thing that we design really needs to be a manifestation of that encounter of those that were part of the process so you know uh, the and that again has a relationship to who are the individuals involved in the process but it's the meeting between those so again the collective that then gives shapes to the form uh, so it's it's kind of a uh, it's, it's essential for us to create the kind of things that we create uh, of course uh, 
yeah, I, th I would say. Uh, but it's then at the same time just really an expression of that. Uh, so the collective and the, and which is also I think why Sudana is also so interested to engage with other practitioners of architects and and peers also creative practitioners because it's in that encounter that we can also achieve something that we don't know what we know or we cannot predict somehow and that makes the whole process much more interesting and fun is that it's really about different competencies uh, knowledge experiences and the coming together in that process that creates something that's kind of unpredicted and that's fun then it becomes worthwhile the effort <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I think I agree with what Alex said, but I just like to add a little bit about, you know, I mean, when people uh, come into a process, they're normally thinking of it from their own point of view. So I think, you know, uh, the process, we're, we're doing a process that respects the individual identity of the people. But then, like Alex was saying, it's about this creating a space for negotiation, because at the end of the day, you know, you have to make decisions as a collective, because when you create something, it's always something that represents everyone's voices and everyone's values in the in the in the output for example in the in the project in bulacan when we were designing the windows everyone had their own ideas about how the windows should be designed how it should look so everyone made their own interpretations of, of what that would look like so they made mock-ups and tests and at the end of the day though we have to only build one version so at the end of the day it was about how people negotiated with each other to kind of create a, a final pattern that becomes the one that we, we used. So at the end, uh, when we finished, we settled on the pattern that you're seeing now in the windows here and the doors. Um, one of the members of the community said, ah, you know, this is like all our products and it's all reflected in, in the design. It's like, it's it, like some parts of it is ours, some parts of it is theirs, but together, you know, it's ours. And so I think that's the beautiful the thing about uh, you know the, you know working together is that somehow you feel like part of it is you and that part of it is you as a group as well. At the end of the day, also seeing that the fruit of your labor is expressed, you know, and strange from the things that you create. You're not just on a production line doing abstract labor. You're actually creating something that means something to you individually and you as a group. So that that connects, uh, I think. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know if it's the right word, but do you discuss about um, particular design style? Because, you know, uh -huh. behind your project, you know, I see some, you know, specific aesthetics or, you know, maybe mm -hmm. you can say beauty and it doesn't differ to project. I think there's some similarities through the project. So mm -hmm. do you often discuss about these, you know, as an architect or as a designer? about the you know style of the building you know um physical environmental design you know um yeah. and level yeah for sure alex, alex and i um discuss a lot for sure about, our, about what we believe a beautiful architecture is or like aesthetic theories also about you know you know what is vernacular or what is actually you know something that is how it relates aesthetically in terms of proportion in terms of scale so all of these issues are some things which we have at the back of our minds. And it's something that we also talk about with the communities as well. So um, in, in the decision about, you know, how the building, for example, is oriented um, on site, one of the, the characteristics was its appearance on how it is viewed from the entry of the, of the field. So the community was specific that they wanted it to have a, a, like a, um, a beautiful vista from, from where they would see it on, on the first run. So, that's not something necessarily that Alex and I, you know, um, gave them. It's something that they wanted to to have initially. So, um, but th that's just one example. But aside from that, you know, in terms of the similarity between the the other projects as well, yeah, I think the projects that we're working with in the context where we are working with are similar. So somehow the the constraints that are imposed on the design project are are, are similar, so that the resultant somehow as a connection to each other. For example, the connection between the joints, it's to do with the availability of timber that is not, you know, we can't get too large sizes of timber in the Philippines and in Vietnam. So the, the, the result of that is, is actually um, to do with the constraints of, of finding the right material sizes that we have. Mm. At the same time, you know, the joints for welding and the, the joints for the doors, I don't know if you, we have a slide for that, but those were all fabricated um, in, in, the, in the workshop besides. So, so everything had to be very, very, you know, basic. <laughs> um, and then that's the result of why 
maybe this 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 basic construction is also the same as what we would do in in Tacloma, which is in the city down down south of Manila. So, I mean, that's one reason that it is a constraint. But also, we find that there is a kind of beauty that is a result of something that is done with a very immediate need as well. Um, something that's very necessary, but it is also something that has its particular character and a particular kind of beauty to it as well. I think an important design decision that Sura and I want to bring into the projects when we engage with communities, the level of openness and the level of um, discussion uh, a construction system or uh, a choice of material can enable over time so that also, uh, you know, one thing is, you know, what happens after we leave, well, the building could grow, when it could develop, it could change, they could change, you know, all these bits, but also in the design process so that we're not necessarily immediately going for these uh, solutions. That means that we cannot develop gradually. We want to have a discussion, we want it to grow with us. So we try to kind of keep uh, working with, you know, the grade 1.2 uh, systems that allow us to, to, to do that discussion step by step uh, with the community. That does you know, get a certain expression, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, actually, I think, I thought that this discussion strongly connects and relates to what Kyuchi-san questioned. So yeah, I'm, I'm now quite clear. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Can I, can I give a comment? Because <laughs> I, I found, you know, this situation very interesting, you know. Uh, let me just introduce, you know, Muraji-san, Yutaro, He's a architect, you know, uh, who does recipe. Do, the recipe is it actually English. Do you understand what the recipe? Re yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, he, he does uh, actually, you know, uh, he did invent, you know, this recipe, you know, of uh, somewhat the wooden house, you know, vernacular building, you know, of uh, Japan. And, uh, you know, like, you know, he provides, you know, that information, you know, as a service, you know, so that mm. like, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's strange, you know, that I'm explaining, you know, actually he, he is here, so, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so, uh, so he does such things, you know, in Japan. So, and what you, you know, talked about right now, you know, I heard that uh, what you said, you know, is like a, something like a reinvention of vernacular do, do you know what I mean? Like, you know, when I say, you know, reinvention means like a reinvention of, say, vehicle, you know, it's like a reverse engineer, you know, this how to, you know, mm -hmm. vehicle, you know, and then, you know, coming back to the principle and then, you know, constructs, you know, like a, they precisely check, you know, that each step and then to make, you know, this vehicle, you know, again, right, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, going through this procedure, uh, of course, you know, that output, you know, becomes slightly modified, you know, to the situation. And then, you know, that becomes, you know, contemporary, you know, somehow. And then what, you know, you guys, you know, do, you know, and, you know, what Muraji-san, you know, does, you know, this recipe, you know, of, you know, wooden, you know, uh, Japanese in a house, you know, somehow similar, you know, from my perspective, you know, looking at, you know, this situation. And if these, you know, two say, like, you know, Muraji-san, you know, is based on Japanese context and you are, you know, based, you know, in, uh, international context, you know, but based on locals, you know, but if those uh, reinventing, you know, pros, uh, approach, you know, becomes like really, say, international, mixed together, and, mm. you know, like in different contexts meets to each other, then, you know, uh, this, you know, approach, you know, can also be, you know, going to, you know, maybe somewhere, you know, we never know, you know, still. Yeah. And, you know, I you know, immediately, you know, kind of felt, you know, this potential or possibility. Yeah. And just by myself, you know, being very excited, you know, so I wanted to just, you know, give a comment. It's not no question or nothing. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. I mean, I think maybe it's about kind of like when we say vernacular, you know, I think somehow it has to do with an, a sense of immediacy, something that you're working with, something which is available, something that's at hand something that is already known and understood and something that um, already exists. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel in a way, but you're thinking about a system of creating a system of building that people can understand. So I think, yeah, uh, I mean, this method is, is very simple. Like when you see it, ah, okay, I, I get how it was built. So there's nothing like so complex here that you can't really relate to. And I think that's important when we are creating like a vernacular idea so that people can add to it. You, you know, they can expand this building over time. They can build another one if they want. 
disassemble it, reassemble it, you know, anything now. So, so this relationship that people have with the object is something that we really think is valuable so that people are able to take ownership of it. Um, yeah. mm. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful connection because, I mean, if you talk about mutual support historically, you know, it has been a way of responding to a situation with the material and the resources available. The result is, you know, what we today would call you know, historical vernacular, you know, or traditional buildings. But it was just a response to the situation that we're in with the conditions and resources they had, right? And the values and meanings that they had. But if we go through that process again today, that would change slightly, right? Hmm. And there might be slightly different responses to it. And, you know, also, yeah, in a more international society uh, or, you know, a global context, what does it mean also in terms of the situation we're in now? So, you know, this discussion, I mean, it's super interesting. Uh, would love to continue this discussion. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's <laughs> so, do you have any other questions or uh, comments? Masami says, yeah. Do you have any comments? No. By the way, Ry Ryoko is here, I think. Yeah, Ryoko is there. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, Hello. Please turn on your camera. Yeah. I, uh, can you uh, can you see me? I yes. just came back home now. <laughs> I was uh, watching your lectures but, uh, in train. Your career, uh, please. Yes. Please, please introduce yourself. Introduce myself. Yes. Um, hi to the audience, right? Yes. I, I know them already. Um, Hi, I'm Ryoko Iwase. I'm an architect and also designing landscape design too. And I'm now uh, as a Kiyuchi san and uh, also with, with uh, Kadowaki san, I'm now joining um, Venice Biennale Japan Pavilion team as an architect. And I'm gonna collaborate with uh, this uh, great lecture uh, in Venice too. Uh, well, a uh, very inspiring lecture and um, I was so glad to see the project. And um, if I have a comment, right? If I could have yes. a comment. Um, I'm actually um, working on a lot of project, uh, public project like you guys, but uh, always uh, it's uh, difficult to keep continuing with uh, uh, the project. I mean, like I, I'm always difficult to find the ideal situation to keep the relationship between uh, locals and also how to maintain the project when after finishing the um, project. I mean, like mm -hmm. after completion of the project actually. But uh, the whole year project have a, a lot of potential to have a lot of influence after the construction. I could imagine firstly, like maybe uh, locals can reconstruction, uh, reconstruct or repair after a few years, or even like uh, without you guys or something. Yeah. And uh, also maybe after learning the process or system from your project, maybe people can do something totally different by themselves. <laughs> Uh, for maybe different projects or something. So I could like to have a kind of episode that uh, you got uh, surprised after the completion. And also it would be nice if I could have a comment on the ideal situation uh, after the completion as an architect, how to maintain how, or how to have a relationship after the completion. Uh, construction okay great comment do you want to give it a go sudar uh, go ahead i think you're looking for some project already right <laughs> clicking uh you know i think well I, I'll, I'll give an example but i also show a you know i'll start showing the diagram because i think the the thing you're discussing is really about what we create and how that has an outcome or how that has an impact beyond the thing that we create um, and I think that really matters in terms of how you create, how you do something affects, you know, what happens with that thing afterwards. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, you might not be in control. 
uh, and things happen that you you know you started things people are now suddenly very capable of designing and they make decisions that you don't necessarily agree with also uh you know so i you know i the example one example i think which is um, this project you know for the time that it was up before it was destroyed by the typhoon you know having built it through by neon having gone through the process of uh, defining what material attributes are important you know what is material what is the structure uh, you know, how do we assemble it uh, to talking about the strategic, like why is this important? Who is, it's for our kids, you know, so, so suddenly like the community has a huge capacity to actually uh, redefine it, you know. Uh, now, an important concept for this building was the idea that, you know, it was a fully openable one. The families, when there's a strong winds, when they will open a building, uh, their own houses, so the wind can pass through. So it's not pushed down by the typhoon. This building, for example, immediately used that concept they wanted to use that concept for the study center so that when a typhoon comes, it won't be destroyed. Now, when the, when the super typhoon hit, it actually survived the peak of the typhoon because the wind was allowed to move through it. So that concept was something that they're very proud of. But again, this analogy, you know, this idea of this is how we built ourselves. They had this concept, uh, Haina Bato, is it so uh, yeah. Which is the Filipino, yeah, this is the Filipino tradition of building uh, once you know you have a two-story building at one and a half uh, with a, a stone base and then a timber structure on top and you know uh, for this building you know you, you they had this kind of heavy base but suddenly they start plastering stones on it you know it was made in concrete <laughs> so these are kind of fake stones and we go like no you don't don't that's that's not the true expression of the material that you're working with but for them it was important because it 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 articulates you know it articulates this idea of behind a bottle so the building then becomes uh, a representation of an idea that was important to them. So they took it beyond, you know, what we would normally do as architects and started clustering stones uh, as decoration on it, you know. So it's like, um, but that's this building actually was transformed. They they painted, they added, they removed. These walls were woven by the mothers. So it kind of kept transforming until it was destroyed. So I think that's the kind of idea that we see architecture, the things that we create with communities as a process that we as architects is part of a part of it. Now we're there for a period of time, but the thing needs to continue after we leave. So the more we can kind of contribute to the way, you know, the train analogy that Suda brought up has been important to us. Is like, if you do a community project, you need to enter a moving train because if the train is not moving, it's not, it's gonna stop when you go off the train later. If you're the fuel, it's gonna stop when you leave the train. So the fuel and the drive needs to be there within the community. So that when you come in as an architect, you contribute and you help them with the direction of where the train is going, but you're not the fuel. The fuel, it will continue the moment you step off. So I think that's kind of a little bit like where I think these processes and directions and we contribute to something and then it continues. Yeah. I think that's that. I'd also like to add um, in, in the project in Bulacanda we did. So we were talking with the communities and, and some of them said that, you know, now, ah, now I know what it feels like to be an architect. So somehow they, they felt that they were doing architecture also, and they were feeling like what it was to be like an architect. So, so some of the, one of the guys, Kuya Joseph, and he, he, he's a farmer and he has his um, little shed out, out there in the, in the field. So he said before, when he was doing the, making his shed, he would just do a shed, like just do it. But now, after going through this process, he says that when he is going to build his next shed, he would now think, you know, where is the light going to come from? Where is the wind direction coming from? You know, what will be the structure? What kind of things do I want to include in it? So he's using the, the, the knowledge that we have shared in his part of the process as something that he's, you know, it's now part of him and then part of the structures that he will build uh, in the future also. So, you know, I, I think everyone wants to have this knowledge as part of yourself. It becomes part of you and it, you know, grows with you as well. He said that it, he's spending so much time now just making decisions before doing that stuff. <laughs> he's yeah, yeah so now, now he's thinking before he does the thing. Yeah, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we had a very, very fruitful discussion today. The new Thank students you. must have been inspired. It has gone very fast, but it's time for us to end. Normally we will have a small party afterwards, <laughs> <laughs> but that is not possible this time. It's a pity, but we, we will save it for next time. 
Yes. Six thing. Give a big clap or or push the like button to Sudan in Alex. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Really Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. <laughs> I will stop the broadcasting.